Hey, this is Dave from the Centurions Review, and today I'm reviewing the Lords of Under Earth Subterranean Warfare. This is a game of subterranean warfare in a dwarven city named Under Earth. The dwarves are under constant attack by both humans and orcs. There are also various monsters that are used in some of the scenarios. Um, this is Metagaming's micro game number 18. This is a game for, uh, there's one solitaire scenario, about four that are two-player scenarios and one that is multiplayer. Um, box looks all right. Um, typical metagaming box. Uh, basically, the game's a dungeon delve is what it is. Um, let's talk about the components. Let's start with the map. The map is the underground city of Under Earth. Uh, I know it looks to you like it's pretty pretty lame looking, but compared to Metagaming's other uh, maps from that area, which were just black and white, this is actually an improvement over their typical map for their micro games. Um, the map it has, uh, right here is a lake. This is um, deep water, and there's corridors, uh, narrow corridors, uh, narrow tunnels, open spaces and rooms and so forth. Um, problem with the map uh, is there's no terrain key so there's it, it's hard to figure out what some of the terrain features are like believe it or not that little arrow there apparently is a stairway that's going up so I would have used a different symbol but and also the real bad part of this map is you can't see it really with this camera I don't think but like here and in a bunch of other places are these yellow markings that tell you to where to place chits for certain scenarios and there's a bunch of these yellow markings all over the map the problem is you can't see the damn things because they're in fluorescent yellow and maybe they were easier to see in the 1980s, but this is an old game and the yellow is faded and stuff. So, I mean, using yellow as a color for those uh, starting points was a really bad idea. Um, as far as the counters, uh, you have dwarves. Uh, let's see. There's some dwarves there. You have humans. You have orcs. And here's some treasures with the uh, treasure points uh, written on them. And you have unalert markers, which just basically tell you that a character is asleep. And you have some. Here's uh, one. I don't know if you can see it there. That's actually a, a door meaning, signifying that you've closed the door. And some for monsters. Um, let me take out a counter for you to see here real quick. I don't know if it can get in focus there, but the number on the left is that that 2 is its combat factor, and the 10 on the right is its movement. Um, the rule book tells you the opposite, but actually as you read through the rule book, uh, you figure out that the number on the left is actually the combat factor, because some of these units are companies, and, uh, well, you have companies and you have individuals, and like the company, some of them have a combat factor of 50, and according to the book in the beginning, that would be the movement, so you would move 50 spaces, which is ridiculous. Um, also, some of the terrain will slow down movement, like stairways and stuff, but like I mentioned before, it's kind of hard to see uh, what the terrain features are when there's no terrain key, but... Uh, what else do we have here? Let me pull out the book for you. Let's go to the sequence of play. Sequence of play, uh, first player's turn, he just does movement, alerting, and combat, and then second player's turn, movement, alerting, and combat. Obviously in the movement phase you move your forces, but what you can also do is infiltrate, meaning if your counter is next to an enemy counter, um, during the movement phase, you can uh, move through the enemy just to get onto another side of them to uh, make room for uh, one of your other forces to get in there so you can gang up on them. Um, alerting, we'll get into that in a minute. That's the main mechanic of the game, and you have combat. Um, stacking, only one company can stack, but uh, the company can have a, a leader with them too who is an individual or on a hex you can have an unlimited number of individuals um the reason that companies want to stack with leaders is because leaders allow a shift on the combat results table and this game actually has a pretty decent uh combat results table we'll get into that too um 
In most scenarios, most of the dwarves will start inverted, meaning they're asleep and they need to be alerted. Uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind in this game is uh, corridors and bridges. Here's a bridge here and uh, like a corridor there. If you're a company that reduces your combat factor by 10 points, and tunnels like right here will reduce a company's combat factor by 20. So one strategy you can use in the game if you're a weak little individual unit is just to go hide in like this tunnel if a company's coming after you. And when he gets in there, it greatly reduces his combat factor. So you might actually survive. Uh, okay. Um, let me show you the combat results table So it's, since it's actually a good one. Um, back in the 1980s, they had some pretty bad ones, but this one's pretty decent. So, like at 6 to 1 odds, uh, Defender's always eliminated. At 3 to 1 on a 1 through 3, Defender eliminated. 4 or 5, Defender retreats. 1 hex, 6, nothing happens. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? If you retreat, you drop your treasure. And victorious units can advance in the vacated hexes. Height advantage, you uh, decrease the uh, odds column and put it in the defender's favor if he's higher than the attacker. Morale effects, that's the important thing. Um, a dragon automatically shifts four columns because he's a dragon and he's tough. Dukes, lords, captains, and chieftains without a company shift three columns. Uh, if they're with a company, they shift two columns, which is huge. Um, a company stacked with a captain or chieftain uh, will shift one column. One thing is, if you're a company with a leader and you're attacking an uh, enemy company with a leader and you both have a shift two to the right, or, or two in your favor, they cancel out. So if you're at one-to-one -one odds, you'll just stay at one-to-one -one odds. It's a good combat results table. Um, let's show how alerting works. Let me zoom in here if I can. Give me one sec here. All right, so let's say this guy was uh, awake when the uh, game started. First thing he's going to do, he's not going to run to attack the unit, this dwarf. What he's going to do is on his movement phase, he's going to go here and on the alert phase, alert this guy. And then the next turn, this guy is going to move to here. And on the alert phase, alert him. And this one actually... Uh, this is a dependent. This is a, a unit that's just civilians, women's and, women and children. Doesn't have a combat factor, but he can move, and he can uh, alert other forces. So on his turn, he alerts this guy, and that guy is a sentry, so he automatically alerts everything within four spaces that's in line of sight. So he'll alert this guy and this guy, and this guy here is a lord. So what would happen then is you. And the, the movement phase, the Lord would stack with a company, and now you have a that's a company with a power of 70. That's a really powerful unit. So now you can take that company and uh, go forth and fight the enemy. So that, that's the basic strategy behind the game is to alert your, if you're the dwarves, is to alert your sleeping forces and uh, get them, uh, your company stacked with leaders so they can go out and kick ass. Um, let's talk about the scenarios. First one is pursuit. Let me, uh, that's a little too zoomed in. Pursuit, that's for two players. Basically, the dwarves are followed back to their city and the humans attack. Most of the dwarves are asleep and must be awakened so they can fight. Uh, the second is surprise attack. That's right down here. Uh, in that one, that's uh, the the previous one was two players, this is two players also. Uh, the orcs conduct a surprise attack and they must kill the dwarf lord. All the dwarves are asleep so the game basically starts with the dwarves being slaughtered but the ones that survive uh, go around and start waking uh, up dwarven units so they can fight back. Here's an interesting one, dragon fire. This is two players, the dragon must kill 12 units to win. And the dwarves will win if the dragon is killed or the dwarves get 40 points of treasure off the map. Um, here's a solitaire version. Uh, it's the exact same thing as the dragon fire scenario except it used the uncontrolled uh, movement uh, rules. They're the simplest uh, 
solitaire AI I've ever seen. All it does is uh, uncontrolled units just uh, move towards the closest enemy until they get next to them and fight them. That's just how, it, I mean, it's just that simple. Next one is Passage of Under Earth for two players. Uh, it's a human and dwarf alliance versus two orcs, or excuse me, versus the orcs. There's also uncontrolled monsters wandering around which can cause uh, trouble for whoever they run into. And it's played until all alliance units uh, are off the map and the level of victory is determined by the number of escaped units. And the last scenario. The last scenario is gold. Um, it's for any number of players, and player, each player starts with a limited number of regular units, and then they use some points they're given to hire mercenaries. The dragon's on the board inverted, along with five inverted dummy counters, so you don't know which one he is. Um, these counters are placed above treasure counters, and the side who gets the most treasure points wins, but they have to be careful because one of these treasures may have a dragon above them. Uh, let's go over the... Uh, good and bad points of the game. Uh, the good point is there's several different uh, races. You got humans, you got orcs, and you got dwarves, and then you even got mercenaries, so that gives a little bit of a variety. Uh, the map is geomorphic. I forgot to mention this. Along these dotted lines here, if you really wish, you can cut the map into three pieces, and you can arrange these three pieces any way you want to have a, a custom map. Uh, the alerting mechanic is what game, makes this micro game unique. M micro games usually try mechanics uh, that uh, bigger games don't generally experiment in because if 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 a micro game doesn't sell, a company's not going to lose that much money, so they can afford to uh, be creative with it because it's not that big a loss if the mechanic doesn't work out. But I mean, this alerting me mechanic is all right. It's it's kind of interesting. Uh, the rules are super easy to learn. Um, yeah, was this 22 pages and they're small pages. You'll have no trouble learning these rules. Uh, the combat results table, uh, it actually enhances rather than ruins the game. Uh, unlike uh, the Avalon Hill um, combat results table, which utterly ruined the game, this is actually a, a decent combat results table. Uh, all the scenarios, even though most of them are for two-player, one's for any number of players, and only one is solitaire, I played all the, all the scenarios, both solitaire and against other people, and they play solitaire just fine, so... And all the scenarios play really fast. This is a really fast-playing game. Um, the game has some bad points, though. Like I mentioned, the yellow markings are really hard to see. One thing that really I don't get is this is a dungeon delve, and why does a dungeon delve not have any magic? I'm not kidding. There's no magic in the game. It's a dungeon delve, and there's no magic. That doesn't make any sense. Um, there's even a scenario in this where it's talking about some wizard and stuff. If it's a dungeon delve, why not have a few characters that are wizards and can cast a few magic spells? When people go into dungeons, generally they have an interest in characters that can cast magic spells. Uh, it just seems kind of weird. Uh, one thing, a player does not stand a chance if their leaders are wiped out early in the game, so uh, if some bad guys come through here and wipe out these dwarves here and wipe out their leaders real quick, the dwarves stand no chance. Um, companies stacked with leaders are what win this game. If your leaders are, or most of your leaders are wiped out early, that's it. You don't stand a chance. Um... The map is a little too claustrophobic, and it seems to, it hinders everyone's gameplay. Um, these tunnels and stuff, I don't know. You, you have, you can use this map to your advantage if you're clever, but most of the time you're going to find uh, having to travel in column and stuff to uh, ruin your plan. So if you can use the map to your advantage, that's great, and it's going to help you win. But I think most of the time you're going to you're going to find that the map's working against you. Though, like I said before, if you're a single unit and you go in a tunnel and a company chases after you, you can use the tunnel to your advantage. But overall, you're going to find that this map is uh, cramping your style. Uh, some of the features on the map are hard, hard to make out because there's no terrain key. Like, I, I've played this game, like, 
12 times. And in the rules, they talk about cliffs. I still, I can't tell you where the cliffs are on this map. I have no clue where they are because there's no terrain key. I, I just don't have the slightest idea where the cliffs are. Um, the only other bad thing, like most micro games, micro games, since they're small games, they're meant to be inexpensive and to play fast and so forth. Uh, it has less depth to it than uh, a larger size game, but that's more due to the fact that it's a micro game than anything else. Overall, what do I think of uh, Lords of Under Earth? Um, it's okay. Uh, most of the scenarios turn in a race to alert uh, dwarven units or for the enemy is in a race to wipe out your enemy leaders and stuff uh, before they can stack with their companies. Uh, problem with this game is, uh, even though it's an okay game, after you've played all the scenarios, there doesn't seem to be much reason to go back and play it again. Uh, there's just not enough replayability. This type of game is most suitable for micro game collectors like myself who want to have, if you're someone who wants to have every metagaming title in your collection, this game is obviously for you. Um, Non-collectors though of micro games, they'll probably be kind of intrigued by the alert mechanic, but once uh, that wears off, uh, they're going to find that while the game is okay, it doesn't have enough depth or replayability to keep going back to it. Um, if you're looking for an old school dungeon delve, I would recommend that you get uh, SPI Death Maze instead. I think uh, most people would like that game better. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, thanks for watching and please subscribe to my channel.